O Unstoppable Real Estate Investors. My name's Rayana Starr. I'm your hostess. And with us today is a, you know, a, a past pal, although we didn't know each other when we were both working at Fortune Builders. Josh and I both worked at Fortune Builders. Josh was on an inside sales team. I was on the business coaching team. So that's kind of where we both got our real estate investing start, so to speak. I mean, other than I owned a brokerage with my mom, but um, so welcome, Josh. It's kind of, it's always fun to reconnect with other fortune builders, employees to see where we are today, post fortune builders and how things are going. So thanks so much. How did you find out about our podcast? Yeah, Rihanna, I think we connected via JJ Zizin's uh, group. Okay. And so, again, it's very much your network is your net worth. And that's what brought us together here. So Okay. All right. Well, so Josh, we'll just dive in. And we have some people joining us live on Facebook. Some will jump into the Zoom. Um, but I want to just first find out, what were you doing before real estate investing, even before you worked at fortune builders what what was josh doing professionally or in your life before real estate happened yeah so great question let me give you some context on it so i'm 34 currently and i bought my first house in 2015 so almost a decade ago uh so i wasn't very old when i got into real estate right I, obviously everybody wishes they got in there younger uh, I was actually, before that, I went to college to be a doctor. Um, I worked for an orthopedic surgeon. And one day this gentleman comes home and he's like, don't do it. I wouldn't let my kids do it. You're crazy. And I'm sitting here I'm like, what? You know, the guy does very well. And he starts ta telling me about how in the 90s, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he used to make a million a year. And now he's lucky to make half that. Well, I grew up very middle class. My parents never made six figures. So I'm sitting here like, dude, what a great problem to have only making five right. a year. Like, okay. poor guy. Yeah. yeah, poor guy, you got it bad. And he's like, no, you don't get it. And he proceeds to ask me, you know, how much debt I have from undergrad. Well, I had, you know, a good amount of debt. And then he paints a picture that I'm going to spend another four years of my life in medical school, um, maybe another five or six between residency and fellowship. And then between all that debt come out a half million in debt. And he thinks that reimbursements for physicians are going to continue to drop where they're going to make one to 300 grand a year, but they're going to be a half million in debt and starting in their mid thirties, their career. And he's like, that's going to really set you back and far behind. So I'm sitting here like, okay, well, Hey, look, like I, I'll grow graduate with a biology degree, what do I do if not med school? So right. he's like, the business, I make more money from that than I do being a doctor. Um, and so I graduate and then I move home and I try starting a home healthcare company. Well, six months in, I have business cards, brochure, website, LLC, Google voice number, but I didn't generate a penny in revenue. And so I didn't know the difference between activity and accomplishment. So my parents come to me and they're like, yo, Josh, and I was living at home at the time of their house. They're like, you got to get a job. Like this whole entrepreneur thing is a pipe dream time to grow up. And they're like, you get a job or get out. Well, I was broke. I had less than a thousand dollars in my name at the time. I was driving an 04 Impala SS with like a quarter of a million miles on it. And my student loans, I could only defer for so long. And so there was a lot of pressure that I had to do something. So to appease them, I took a job selling weed control and fertilization for six months. And uh, it was a local spot down the street. And that allowed me to save up enough money to actually buy my first house, which was really cool. Very cool. Now, that was buy your first house to just live in for yourself. Were you thinking then, OK, I'm going to be a real estate investor? Yeah, so that actually was a rental. I uh, really cool story. I bought it for. I still remember this. Obviously, the numbers like it was yesterday. I bought it for one hundred two seven four three. Was the exact purchase price. Um, I did a FHA loan, but didn't move into it. I just didn't have enough money for a conventional loan and kind of played the system there. And then I moved a buddy from high school in it for twelve hundred a month. My mortgage and everything was seven hundred seven a month. Um, and so there was, you know, cash flow of 500. Obviously back then I didn't prepare for things like reserves and all of that, but I got very fortunate that nothing went wrong in the time I owned that house. But it really, you know, I was in it for like maybe four grand and then obviously made more than that my first year in net cash flow. And, and I was hooked experiencing that extra income. Okay. And then from there, share your, your real estate investing journey and talk about where you, where you found fortune builders, what you were doing there. Like, tell us the whole story. Yeah. So this is really great, right? So this is 2015. I buy that house. And then obviously I experienced the benefits of cash flow. How I pivoted to real estate back then is I had an aunt who was in real estate, did very well. 
Um, and obviously just seeing someone else in my family that did it, I knew I could do it as well. Uh, but what I knew I could do better was I was at that lawn care company making on track to make about 60 grand that year, which is more money than I ever made in my life at the time. And I would look around at my coworkers and just, they didn't have the lifestyle I wanted. And then the career trajectory at best there was branch manager and you can make maybe a hundred grand. And right. And that was, you know, kind of like the pinnacle of what that was and nothing against those coworkers. They just didn't have the habits and lifestyle that I wanted. Right. Meaning a lot of them went home and drank every day. They just weren't, you know, personal development growth people like I was at Fortune Builders. So I'm looking around and at this point I have a, a decent sales skill because one of the things with the lawn care company in Michigan, we would cold call in the winter to try to pick up clients. So you're literally telemarketing with snow on the ground being like, hey, look, I want to sell you lawn care for the next season. So you really, really had to cut your teeth and develop your skill. Right money there. So I'm looking around and uh, I had visited San Diego a few times and I really liked that city. And I also already was a little bit in real estate. And so I was looking for sales jobs specifically in San Diego. And when I found fortune builders and their inside advisor position, uh, I went all in, applied and uh, thankfully got it. And I, I really didn't know hundred percent what I was getting into or the extent of that organization. Uh, but that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, right? As you saw the amount of talent and quality that they attracted and that organization internally and externally was very congruent with the way they operated. Yeah, I had, um, I was very grateful and had a very positive experience in my employment at Fortune Builders as well. I feel very grateful for my time there. I was there for five years, almost to the day I was there for five years. And I, it was a very positive experience for me as well. Yeah. And inside sales, they would always have, have this metaphor of you come there a caterpillar and you leave a butterfly, right? Like there's this metamorphosis and transformation and even more so to the story, you know, when a, when a butterfly or a caterpillar goes into the cocoon, you know, there's struggle to get out, it's pain, there's growth. And there was really a lot of that in that journey, right? We worked a ton of hours. They had very high standards, you know, they measured a lot of metrics. So everything was very performance-based, but they incentivized based on that as well. So the high performers got compensated very well. And, uh, they yeah, also... and there was a lot of recognition too. Yes, I agree. Great. They did a great job. Looking back, I'm very grateful for it. When I was in it, sometimes it was tough because it was a lot of hours, but you know, I, I, I miss that environment now that that's no longer there. So. Yeah. Okay. So how long were you working at Fortune Builders? Yeah. Great question. So I moved there uh, May of 2016. And where did you grow up? What state? Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. Uh, so Michigan. Oh God, you probably loved San Diego once you moved there. Yeah. No winters. It was, it was amazing. Mild yeah. very temperature, not a lot of rain. So it was really great. So I moved there 2016. Um, and then I probably late 2017, I started getting an itch of, Hey, like, look, I've kind of topped out as the inside sales position. Um, and actually a buddy and I pay $7,500 for one hour, one-on-one -on -one with Grant Cardone. Cause we're, we're going to start our own sales training company. That was our goal at the time. And 2017 Grant Cardone was known for sales training, not apartment investing. So fly out from San Diego to Miami, meet with Grant. Grant says, hey, son, if I was your age and I could do it all over again, I would have skipped sales training and went straight to apartment investing. I'd be a billionaire instead of a millionaire. The only question is how many times over? Uh, so obviously Grant's a bold guy for everybody who knows Grant Cardone, and but he's got some results, right? He's supposedly now a billionaire. At the time, he had a nine-figure net worth. And then independently, when we got back, went and met with Than, and Than said he wished he would have skipped residential real estate and went straight to commercial investing. So I had two people that I knew did very, very well uh, saying that this was the way to go. So 2017, as I'm still working at Fortune Builders, on the side, I'm starting to learn commercial real estate investing, right? I'm going to seminars, I'm buying courses, you know, reading books, podcasts, YouTube, just engrossing myself into it. Well, I, my buddy, Dylan, who went to go visit Grant, uh, he basically reached out to these two multifamily operators, Jake and Gino, and was like, hey, I see that you're building an education company and they're, they're good investors in the apartment side. I'm in a real estate education company. I'll help you build and scale that company if you teach me how to invest in apartments. And at the, at the time, they weren't looking to hire someone. So they said, hey, kid, we're not interested. No, thank you. Well, a couple months go by, they reach back out. And in that time, Dylan had quit fortune builders, moved to Atlanta because San Diego is not a good market for apartment investing. It's very, very, you know, uh, tenant friendly. Um, and he had enough houses from the passive income club. We had a few thousand dollars a month coming in and passive income. And so they reached back out and they're like, hey, we're looking at taking someone on. Are you still available? 
Well, because he had already established his roots in Atlanta to invest, he was like, look, I can't do it, but I have a really good friend who'd be a great fit. Now introduce him to me. And then we have a talk and here's where I'm at a real conundrum in my life, right? They offer me a position, but since it's a startup, it's a pretty big pay cut from what I was making at fortune builders, right? Very established there. And so I had to, I actually consulted with, I'm sure you know him, Chris Robinson, right? The John Maxwell leadership coach. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up making the leap, right? Because I realized that it was two steps back for like five steps forward. And then uh, I spent five years with Jake and Gino building their real estate education company. And in that time, I did 12 apartment deals while partnered with them. And that really got my foot in the door and got me going. And then about two years ago, I left them. I just got to a point where my passive income more than covered my bills. And uh, I wanted to do my own thing. And so then that's sort of, I guess, a, a condensed version of all that, but happy to expand on it. Yeah, that's awesome. So just curious, what's like, so you really learned early on how to go find volume, you know, and mm -hmm. you, you're young still. And how long ago, not how long ago, how long were you investing did it take for you to get to the point where your passive cash flow from your rental portfolio covered your whole cost of living and all your bills where you literally don't have to work if you don't want to? How long did that take you to get there? Yeah. So great question, right? So again, bought my first house um, in 2015. And then there's kind of some milestones along the way, right? So like, I'll give you in the multifamily side, like the first deal we did, we bought October of 18 and we syndicated it, bought 132 units for 5.9 million. And then we sold that deal three years later for 10 million. And although that didn't provide me, it was a, a huge liquidity event for me um, that didn't provide the passive income. Although what that did provide was a larger nest egg for me to invest in my own deals that we, with our own money bought, and then allowed that to have permanent cash flow, right? And so that gave me a, a, a huge chunk to do that and have that money work for me. Um, I would say probably about three, four years ago, my passive income exceeded my bills. And then that was a pretty cool point. However, it still was tough leaving the day job, right? Because that was a, a pretty significant income. Um, and truthfully, it cut my income in half leaving it there. And so it's always a scary point when you step back. Although you're safe, right? It still is a, a huge step backwards, right? But again, just like when I left Fortune Builders, I had to take a step backwards to grow forward. And I knew that I wanted to do my own thing. And I was in a position where I, I have the safety and security. I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, not yet at least. And uh, you know, there's time to risk it, right? What's your sign say behind you? No one cares, work harder. <laughs> okay. So you're single, you don't have kids. You're at a point now where your passive rental income um, exceeds your cost of living. So you don't have to work. What are you doing now? Are you wanting... Do you have a goal to have a thousand doors? Um, and if so, why? Is that an ego goal or is there a, are you at a point now where it's about legacy? What's driving you now, Chris? I mean, gosh. That's it. So that's a really great question, right? And I love the depth of that. So let me explain. When I left Jake and Gino, I took a year off and just traveled, right? Hung out with friends. And the thought process behind it is I was really disappointed that I, I left that company, right? I wanted to lean my ladder up against the wall and climb that and build with someone long term. Uh, but at the same time, it was for the better, right? And I'm not mad about it or upset. And so I knew that I wanted to take some time to get clear on the next thing I could do so I could do it for the rest of my life, right? So like you're asking, what do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? Who do I want to do it with? We're all very important questions, right? What does life look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? What's important to me outside of work? And one of the things I realized in there is I previously had set my goals on, like I did really well at fitness and finances in my life, but some of the other apps like family, faith and friends, I may have neglected in order to, to get where I was at in life. And I realized that I wanted to be more well-rounded in the five Fs. Um, I also realized that I, I didn't want to work for anyone ever again, right, to start my own thing. And so now our attention is focused on small multifamily in Northeast Florida. Um, we're actually buying an eight unit right now. 
um, which is a really cool deal. Happy to walk you through kind of the logistics on that. And then the other thing was, obviously, my bread and butter was multi, a real estate education, right? That's what I've been in for forever. And one of my challenges with a lot of the companies that we worked for, right, like you, you and I at Fortune Builders, you and at Jake and Gino, was sometimes I thought they would do things that maybe weren't the best for the students, right? And I- And I, charge enormous tuitions. Yeah, yeah, well, they had to because their marketing costs are so high, right? So yeah. I was- so you know what I'm going to, and that's the reason I left Jake and Gino is they had these <laughs> and various things like this. And I just didn't feel good about what we were doing anymore. Right. It, it didn't feel pure. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to create what I wish I would have had when I first started. And then also I'm going to bring in experts. So even at where I'm at in life, I can continue to scale and grow my own portfolio. Right. So selfishly, there's benefit in it for me as well. Um, and then also I'm, I'm more than happy to partner with students. So the current two things we're doing again is small multifamily in Northeast Florida, uh, currently looking at buying them with our own money and then doing value add plan and then refining our money out and holding those for the long term. Um, I think the so are you creating your own little syndications? No, they're joint ventures, so we're not raising up. Okay, capital. they're not joint ventures. They're, I mean, they are joint ventures, they're not syndications. Got it. Yes, correct. And I like syndications, right? When you're getting started or to take down bigger deals, there's a lot in right. there. However, you know, just like, a, you know, like I told you a month ago, like 43 in a deal. Uh, sure. I made a good amount of money. Right. But now that creates problems for me. One, it's a taxable event. So if I don't buy more and get more depreciation, I'm going to pay a very large check to the government at the end of the year. <laughs> Uh, where when I go through and buy something and force appreciation in it, and then I refinance my money out, that's a loan, that's tax-free. And then a lot of times, if I buy the right deal, I can refi all my money out, right? And then I just hold for the cash flow, where sure, that sale is very cool. It's like a long-term flip, uh, but I, I really like stacking assets and passive income is my goal. Because the ultimate goal like that you asked, I thought was a really good question, is I want to be the kindergarten room dad. I want to coach Little League for my kids, and I want to travel the world with my family. And, you know, it's not sure money helps, but really money is just a tool for time freedom to get me there. All right. So let me ask you this, because I want to come back to the the current project in Florida. Mm -hmm. Where are you living right now? Um, I am living in St. Augustine, Florida. So an hour south. Okay. So you left San Diego. So you're in Florida. Oh, St. Augustine. God, what a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. How old are you right now? 34, turned 35 in June. All right. What about the wife and kids? Where, where, when are you going to, yeah. is there, is there going to be Josh goes, okay, now I'm focusing on the other three F's and you're going to put together a whole little strategy and, and program on now I'm looking for the wife to make the babies. Yeah. So, all right. Great question. So I've been very intentional the last nine months of dating to do that. And I think I actually even hired a therapist for this, right? Because I, that's how I've got success in other areas of life and I'm not ashamed of it. And so it started with getting clear on what I want, what's a deal breaker and what I what's something that's an ideal trait, but not a deal breaker, right? So that's very important. And then cutting loose girls that are not wifey material right away, right? Because I don't want to waste their time, lead them on or mine. Um, and just trying to find that. So I have been intentional in the dating. I do believe that who you marry is the most important decision you'll make in your life. Um, and oh, so yeah. <laughs> not something I take lightly. And also there's a lot of people that have a lot of trauma or baggage out there, right? And I'm not dogging them, but I just, I have high standards for myself and I want that in my significant other and other half as well. So. So you're on a mission now. You're, you're, you're in project wife mode. Yeah, Ariana, here's what I don't want, right? I don't want, I'm 34 now. I'd love to have a couple of kids before 40. I do not want 10 years from now, I'm still in wife mode. And then I finally find them and I go to my kid's high school graduation. They're like, oh, you brought your grandpa? Because I'm so right. old. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, avoid. so you got to get busy, dude. You got to find her. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Okay, so <laughs> let's come back to the project in Florida. Walk us through it. Okay. So this is a really cool project. So yeah. for anybody that knows Florida, it's in the San Marco market. So San Marco, Riverside are, are probably one of the better neighborhoods in Jacksonville. Um, it's also right across the bridge from downtown where Everbank Stadium is, where the Jaguars play. Um, and there's a few billion in development going on down there, right? Shad Khan, the owner of the Jags, is spending $1.4 on a new stadium. They're building a Four Seasons. That's a very expensive hotel. 
Um, they're also putting in a lot of shops, so a lot going on in that area, right? So the appreciation is going to be through the roof. Uh, but this deal, we found it about a year ago. And so this is tells you the importance of follow-up. And when we found it, it was actually 14 units. So an eight and a six unit. And it was listed with a broker for an astronomical price, right? And so obviously no one bought it because it was listed for so long. And then I ended up getting connected directly with the owner. And then finding that the reason they're selling is partner infighting. And that finally, they're just ready to rip the bandaid off and let it go, right? And so this guy's in real estate as is, but his other partners weren't. And so... Um, where it's it's eight units, uh, 1930s vintage. Back which... up a second. Mm -hmm. Found it a year ago. Yes. He's given us some history. How was it that you got connected directly to one of the owners? Okay, so this is great. I'm glad you asked. So there's a yeah, strategic networking and relationships are so important in this business. They really are in any business and in life, but you developing a relationship with one of the owners it sounds like maybe the key decision maker or the the mediator of the the group um here it is a year later you know and so tell us that story because that's what really got the deal on your doorstep isn't it is building yeah. that relationship so yeah, a relationship got me this relationship. So there's a, a broker with NAI, his name's Luke McCann, young, hungry rock star broker. And he called me, he's like, hey, Josh, what are you doing right now? I'm like, uh, I don't know why, what do we get into? And he's like, meet me at this property. I just got a call from this owner. He's interested in selling. I'm going to give him a BOV, which is a broker opinion of value. And so I meet him on site at this property. And I already knew that that owner specifically and knew that he wanted an astronomical price. Uh, so I knew that I couldn't buy that property. Although Luke might be able to get a retail buyer, right? I'm not that. So I'm on the property with Luke and, you know, through having the relationship with that broker, we're sitting there and we're, we're you know, shooting the shit. And basically he's like, Hey, I have a deal that I know a guy wants to sell, but it's, it's not something I, I want to represent because I mean, the deal is only a couple hundred. It's, it's not an eight, $10 million deal, right? Commercial brokers are chasing bigger checks. And he's like, I'll introduce you to the owner. And so then he starts telling about this deal. And I'm like, Oh dude, I'm well aware of this deal. But before I was going through the broke ridge, um, not direct to the owner to get the deal. Well, the, the owner was you know willing to take it off the brokerage. So he's saving on fees that way. Um, I get the connection through my buddy, Luke, who's another commercial broker at NAI. Um, and then I, I meet with this guy, build the relationship, you know, meet him on site. And that's how we were able to find the deal. So it was through our connections. And I wish I could say the consistent follow-up from a year ago through that brokerage got me there, uh, but it was still through a connection. And that's the importance of relationships putting your best foot forward, right? And then the other thing is too, when we close on this deal, the broker, Luke, although he's not representing the deal, I will throw him a pretty significant five-figure kickback for for you know this connection relationship, right? And I think when you take care of people and pay it forward, it always comes back around. And once you got introduced to the owner, you said, and built a relationship. Talk about how you build a relationship because you've been kind of working on this deal for a year it's yeah. only 14 units why was it worth it why was it a year talk us through that relationship building and that process of what's what was happening over the course of that year so that's great. So I think for a framework for relationship building, how to win friends and influence people is a must. If you can read that book and master those principles, you'll be so much further ahead, right? So my goal when connecting with the owner was not the deal. My, my goal is the relationship with him, right? Because if you're short-sighted, you might win the battle, but lose the war, right? Or you could even burn it that earlier. So I just, he was a gentleman who's 38, a little bit you know older than me, and he, he's been quite successful in real estate. So obviously put my ego aside, just got to know him, his story, what his goals were. And then truthfully, I was looking for ways that I could add value or make things work, right? Pain points I could solve for him. Um, and although none of, there was no hitch on that for this deal, uh, we did end up realizing we have a lot in common and he ended up liking me because I had a true interest in him and his story and, and came with a genuine approach. Um, and then when that happened, that allowed me to, or him to get excited about who he's selling it to. Um, and kind of give me some guidance through this opportunity. So the deal itself to kind of dive into it, it's eight units, again, built in 1930s. It's in a really, really attractive submarket. Now the deal is currently vacant. I don't normally buy vacant deals, right? I normally buy cash flowing from day one. There's a lot of risk in vacant deals. 
However, we're probably going to get this deal for 700,000. And again, it's in a great sub market. Rents are very expensive. We're going to go through and put 400,000 into this deal. So we're redoing everything, right? We're probably going to do like an A-class renovation on the interiors. So stainless steel, gooseneck faucets, quartz countertops, you know, really nice LVP. Um, it's going to be a, a really, you know, like black matte finish for the bathroom fixtures. It's going to look really, really beautiful in there. We'll probably get close to $2 a square foot in rent. Um, the four or the two or the four two ones are 900 square feet. The four one ones are 818. So they're large one ones. And then we'll be in it for about a million one. We're going to fund it all cash, me and a partner or two. And then we'll, because construction loans are expensive right now, by the way, right now, my community bank, which I would loan through, they're, they're at like 9% for their construction loan. And so I have the cash. Why not fund it that way? And then after we go through, we have about six months for renovations, which it should take less than that. And then six months for lease up and stabilization. Because when I go to refi, we'll go to agency debt. We'll do a Freddie Mac small balance loan. And they require 90% occupancy for 90 days. And then their loan balance minimum is a million. So this thing will be worth about a mil and a half, a mil six when we're done. And then we'll refi out at least a million of our money, kind of depending on where rates are at and a few other things. Uh, so then I'll own this asset with very little or none of my own money in it. And this will still pay me every day. And then it'll be a pretty much a brand new asset. I mean, again, we're putting in $50,000 a door in renovations doing everything. And so at that point, there'll be very little CapEx. And then in a, a sub market, that's rapidly rising as well. So we're, that's why we're very excited about this opportunity. And that's the type of deals I like to buy and why I buy them because of the refi and then repurpose that money and continue to stack cash flow. So talk to people about what numbers they need to look for, for an investment to be a good rental, because I think um, newer investors, they don't understand one, just to how to even evaluate a deal as a rehab, let alone a rental. And there's a lot more numbers to consider as a rental like CapEx, cash on cash, net operating income, you know, the cap rate, all of that. So talk about those numbers and what you look for to determine, and are you following the 1% rule and all that? So talk about some of the parameters or some of the criteria you look for to determine if a rental is a good investment. Yeah, that's a great question. So let's first talk about what I buy and then the returns I look for in it um, at a high level. So I buy 70s or newer B and C class assets, right? In B minus or better areas. Um, and so I'm looking for deferred maintenance, you know, rents at least 20% or more below market. Uh, but at the same time, I usually don't buy rough projects like this, right? And I stay away from things like Zinsco, Stablock, Fed Pacific Breakers. They're just an insurance nightmare. Um, and anybody who knows the Florida market knows insurance here is already pretty tough. The natural disasters are not any fun. Uh, so I buy those deals. I usually look for cash flowing from day one. So when you underwrite it as is, so as is income and normalized expenses, I want at least 5% cash on cash going in. And then after stabilized, I want at least 8% cash on cash. And those at a high level, those are sort of what I look for. Um, but why I like so explain, this. Explain, let me interrupt a sec. Explain Please. cash on cash to those people that don't have experience buying rentals. Explain what that, that means to them. Yeah. So that means if I have a hundred grand into the deal, right, I'm getting that year five grand in cash flow. And that's net cash flow, right? And that's ex in taking out you know, putting into my CapEx reserves and, and all of your other expenses. So you got to, it's not just, hey, here's the mortgage, here's the taxes, here's the insurance. It's it's taking out all the expenses in there. And so that's your your free net cash flow from the deal. And then it's, you know, it's, it's what's your return divided by the cash in. Okay. So. What else? What other numbers do you look for um, to determine if it's a good investment for you for a rental? Yeah. So here, let, we can even go a little bit deeper than that, right? So when yeah. I first start, what I'll do is my my underwriting process is I'll pull the census tract median income, and that number has to be north of forty thousand, right? So I do not buy in war zones. Um, the second thing is if it's under fifty thousand, what I'll do is I'll go on crime maps and I'll look at the crime in the area, and I'll see in general is crime decreasing and is it below the the national average in the U.S. right? Um, sometimes you can buy these areas that are a little bit rougher, but you know, there's gentrification going on in that area, right? The path of progress. 
Um, that's a more advanced and experienced move, but I definitely do not buy in really rough areas and try to gentrify the whole area. You know, I'm not a, a Dan Gilbert who owns Quicken that did that with Detroit. I'm not a billion multi-billionaire where I can, you know, do that. Right. So I stay away from those. The next thing I checked is I go through and I check if it's in a flood zone. Uh, I do not buy in flood zones. Right. I think those are really, really tough. I think it's, it's just too much risk and insurance is already a nightmare here. So that's a challenge that I can avoid. The next thing is I don't buy products in general that are 60s or older. Um, just a lot of that, you got to replace electrical, you got to replace plumbing. There's just so much more CapEx, right? These older buildings, you can only put lipstick on a pig so many times. Um, so I, I usually stay away from things like that. Um, and those, those are a high level sort of what I, I look for. And then again, the reason I want 20% or more below market rents is apartments are valued based on the NOI, right? The formula for value is NOI divided by cap rate. And for those of you who don't know, NOI is net operating income. And what that is, is you take the gross income. So all the income the property makes, you subtract out all the expenses before the mortgage or debt service, and then you divide that by the cap rate, right? Now, one move I see rookie investors make is they're like, oh, I buy certain cap rate assets. Well, going in cap rate doesn't matter. Uh, stabilized cap rate is what matters or your exit cap rate, right? When you refi or sell. And the reason- So explain cap rate to the newbies. Yeah. So again, cap rate equals NOI divided by value. And what that is, is a measure of what someone is willing to pay for something, right? So if you take an A-class asset, which is brand new, it's generally going to have a lower cap rate than like a C or D-class asset, right? Because in the lower the cap rate, the higher the value. They have an inverse relationship um, because that, that A-class asset is going to have better tenants, right? The higher rent, better credit. Uh, they're renting probably by choice, not because they have to and they can't afford a house, where, you know, a B, C or a D class tenant, you know, they're probably renting as they have to, they can't afford a house, right? They're probably working a blue collar job. They may not have the best credit score. So there's a little bit more risk, not only in the tenant, but with the building as well. Um, and so why stabilize or why cap rate going in doesn't matter is, you know, I'll give you an example. I bought a 48 unit deal that was half occupied and rents were 150 below market. And because cap rate is, is based on that income, you know, NOI divided by value, I bought it at like a two cap, which most people say that's crazy. But when I forced up the income and forced appreciation, you know, it was probably an, an eight or a nine cap stabilized. And so that's what's really important is, is that, you know, and that's why I think going in cash on cash is a better metric. I like it. What else do you want us to know? Yeah. So one thing, as you go in this, a challenge you're going to be having in the industry is you're going to get a broker's, you know, offering memorandum, right? In there, the broker is going to give you a pro forma. Now, more than likely, they're going to, it's going to be a really rosy picture and probably overly optimistic of what the property can do. And what that means is some of their rent comps that they use tell you that you can get rent up so many dollars. It might be a newer complex with nicer amenities and bigger units. And sure, they, they, you know, you might be able to move the rent up some, but a lot of times that that picture is ultimately too rosy. So what you got to do is trust, but verify, and you got to build out your own rent comp matrix, right? And the easiest way to do that is to find comps that are similar in, in vintage amenities, size, and area. And it's an art, not a science, right? Meaning there's going to be, there's no perfect comp normally. And then you, you find out the average price per square foot of each unit size, and then you figure out, are you going to do a renovation similar to that unit, right? So if you find one down the street and they're getting $2 a square foot and your complex is currently getting $1.30, you know, and you see that they have, you know, you have just resurfaced countertops and old cabinets that are painted and, you know, white appliances where they have stainless steel and again, gooseneck and quartz and really fancy lighting and stuff like that. You better budget twelve, thirteen thousand dollars to do the renovations to get similar rents like that. So you just got to make sure that your business plan can support that, and you have enough evidence to support that. Love it. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting out? Like a lot of people, Chris, Josh. I keep wanting to call you Chris because I was talking to Chris Pod was my guest like last week or the week before. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who wants to build up a rental portfolio, but doesn't have capital? They don't have the 20% to put down. Um, a lot of people, as we know from our fortune builders days, 
we'll teach people, well, wholesale and rehab, that's the active investing side of the business and build up your capital by doing that and then invest it in, in rentals. And we know Than and JD and, and, and Paul all had said, Wow, knowing what we know now, we wish we had started acquiring rentals a lot sooner than we did. Yeah. So let's just say someone doesn't have, they don't have, they're not, they don't want to wholesale, they don't want to rehab, they want to buy rentals, but they don't have a lot of capital. How would you advise them to get started? Ooh, that's a great question. And I can give a lot of value on this answer and shine a lot of light. So what I would do is get clear on what you're looking to buy. So my recommendation would be join a group that's syndicating uh, because syndication, you're essentially raising capital from investors to buy these deals and join an experience group and then find out one, what they would, you know, how they would compensate if you brought them a deal or raise capital for them. So the two lowest hanging fruits are being a deal finder. And in general, 20% of the GP, which is the general partnership for the group that's syndicating the deal is allocated to the person that finds it. Um, and watch, we'll play through a good example of how that would work out. So let's say, for example, my first deal, we bought for 5.9 million, we syndicated it. Uh, we did a 3% acquisition fee. So 3% of 5.9 million is 177,000. Now, if you're getting 20% of that, because you have 20% of the general partnership, that's a pretty large number, right? And it's it's not sure a life-changing check, but you know, again, to get, I don't know, $35,000 in a check when you don't have any capital is pretty good. And then really the biggest way of getting uh, biggest way of getting compensated as a syndicator is when you sell on the back end, right? So again, let's say you have 20% of the general partnership because you brought that deal. Uh, we did a 70-30 split of the upside. So from the 5.9 to the 10 million, 30% of that went to us as the GP. So let's just say 1.2 million. Now, if you have 20% of that check, I mean, that's, that's $240,000. Now at this point, you have a good amount of money to be able to place into deals. And all you got to do is have that money work for you, right? So don't go out and buy the Lamborghini. Don't buy the car. Right, so that's someone who's savvy, who is is a is a savvy networker, which a lot of people are not. They're strategic. They've got, they know how to connect people. They've got some sales skills. But I'm talking about someone yeah, who good. doesn't even have that. How could they start? buying a rental if they have no capital and they're just starting out? What would be the fastest, easiest way for them to buy a rental? Man, see, that's how I got started was doing that, raising capital and finding deals for a partner. Uh, <laughs> if I were to do <laughs> limited capital, start again, I would <clears throat> find an education group or a mentor. That, that's the truth on what I would do there. And the reason being is, look, you can, the knowledge you'll obtain from that is very incredible. And in fact, I mean, Rihanna, I have a question for you. Have you seen The Matrix, that movie? And this is a good analogy. Yeah. Okay. So do you remember in the first one when Neo goes to fight Morpheus and they, they plug the thing into the back of his head and all of a sudden he learns karate and he's out there doing these moves he's never done before? In, in my opinion, that's what education and mentors have done to me, right? All these things that I've never done in my life, I was able to learn how they did it, learn from their mistakes and shorten the time for me to go out there and do it. And so I think if you can acquire the skill set, it's very important. Or another analogy to hammer this in, when it really hit for me, is I read the book by Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in there, one of the habits, there's a story that this guy's walking through the forest and he sees these two guys with this old school saw and they're sitting there just so sawing away. And as he gets closer, you know, they're sawing this tree down. He sees that the saw is really rusty and basically he comes up to him and he's like, Hey guys, don't you think it'd be like smart to sharpen the saw? And they're like, no time too busy. And so the analogy or what's pulled from that is like, you have to sharpen the saw. So you're effective with the time that you implement in your business. And so I learned that very early on with the home healthcare company where I did six months and had no results. Where then all of a sudden in real estate, I had mentors, I had education, I had a peer group. Um, and I, I started getting results much quicker because of that. So again, my answer would be take what little money you have, invest in an education group and a mentor and right, you got to vet them thoroughly. So are they doing what you're looking to do? Um, do they care for you? Do you get a good vibe for them? And then I would go all in and I would hundred percent. I think that not, that will open up the doors for you to create success with all the resources, knowledge and education tools you need. Love it. Now, beyond that, let's say, 
okay, they get the education. Now they're ready to buy their first rental. They don't have 20% down. They're not going to go spend their time in a syndication. Just an average person who wants to get a few rentals under their belt for a little bit of passive income. How do they get that first one? Okay, cool. So I haven't done this, right? So I'm just speaking theoretically, but if I was in that situation, what I would do is I would hope that I'm able to find a hard money lender um, in the for a deal. I would find a value add property. I would think big, but start small, right? So maybe a duplex, a quad, things like that. And I would find a deal that I know that after I go through and do all my renovations, that the deal is worth enough where I can refi and own that thing with no cash in it, right? So I can pay back my hard money lender, and then ultimately have this deal with none of my own cash in it, and then it's still cash flow. Uh, however, I know as real estate prices have climbed, finding a deal like that is is harder and harder. You know, obviously, and well, a hard money lender doesn't cover all of the deal. Usually, a hard money lender, they're going to cover sixty five to ninety percent of the purchase price and all of the rehab. So you still, they still want some skin in the game, and most of them won't even let private money lenders who fill in the gap funding even be in second position. So how do you Okay, so I can that. speak like to this. So when we did our first yeah. syndication in June of 2018, I bought an Airbnb, right? So I spent a good amount of money, bought that. And then October of 18, we go and buy the syndication. Now I put 75 grand as in as an LP and I didn't have all $75,000. So, okay, let's say you find a good, hard or private money lender. And let's say they're willing to fund up to whatever percent, right? Let's say it's 70, 75. Again, I haven't done this. So I don't know the insides and outs, but what I did to get extra capital for my next deal or that deal I did this indication was I got a concierge check for my credit card and it was 0% interest for 18 months. And it was a 3% transaction fee. Now my capital one card, I had like a $30,000 limit. And so I wrote myself a check for $25,000 and I put that in the deal. And then if you annualize 3% interest over 18 months, it's very, very, very cheap money, right? Almost free. And so at that point, I, I was able to pay that back within 18 months for my income for my job. And so let's say you have that private or hard money lender, uh, then you can you, you don't have your own money, then you can maybe leverage your credit and 0% cards to go out there and buy some of the resources needed to rehab that property. Now, again, anytime you're taking on debt, right, it can ultimately make you go further faster, but leverage can be risk if you don't know what you're doing. So that's the word of caution there. Yeah. You got to be careful because you do have to have a plan for paying off those credit cards before the 0% interest is um, is up because then you're it's, it's ridiculous, the interest rates on credit cards. So, okay. So now on this project in Florida, is it closed? Are you guys, do you have it? Or are you just still under contract? Tell us what the timeline on, is on that. Yeah, so great question. Again, because we are direct to owner, we have no competition here. And so we're waiting for our last bids from our contractors. Um, we know the owner's not shopping it anywhere. And so what we're finalizing is our purchase price on it. However, I mean, it, it's pretty much locked up because of the um, you know, the relationship we have with the owner. And then obviously our conservative underwriting, right? We, I don't buy deals just to put capital away. Uh, obviously, because I only have, I'm using my own money. I can only buy so many deals a year. And so we make sure we buy deals that are very conservative and our downside risk is covered. And actually right now is a time where I'd be very cautious in the multifamily space, meaning I think it's a very good time to buy and there's a lot of opportunity. However, if you look nationwide, there's a lot of inventory that's coming online or like new units getting delivered because when rates were so cheap in 2021, there were so many construction starts that are now just getting delivered. And then also with interest rates being high, it's tougher to make deals work. And so although that the flip side of that, it is causing pain because a lot of people had short-term loans, whether it be bridge debt or some sort of variable rate construction loan, where when the rates went up so fast, it's really causing, again, a lot of pain where they have to do a cash in refinance to get the stabilized debt, or they have to sell, right? And sell for what they owe in debt and you know lose their equity. And so it is a very good time to buy, if I'm being honest, right? Prices are back down to like 2018 prices. And here in Jacksonville, cap rates have risen well over 100 
basis points. And again, higher cap rate, lower purchase price. So it's a great time to buy. But you know, with the flip side of that is I'm not writing rent increases until 2026, maybe, right? I'm flat this year, flat next year. So it's not like 21 where rent was going up double digit. And so there is, and then with the new units coming online, you know, there's an increase in vacancy and then an A class space here, rents are actually dropping. So not just they're not increasing, they're going down. And so although choppy C's, you know, is a good time to buy, you need to be a skilled seller to, to really navigate that. And so I, my opinion, no deal is better than a bad deal. And so it's like, yo, you got to make sure you're vetting these things inside and out before you buy them. Love it. So if you were to jump up on a rooftop and, well, let me ask you one more question. Um, when you think of the few years, it's been about nine years since you bought your first place. What would you say for you has been the biggest challenge in real, in investing in real estate? Okay, so this is a great question. When I first started studying multifamily, you know, Q4 of 2017, it took me until October of 18 to close my first deal. And so I went a full 13 months from the day I started studying till the day I closed on that deal. And Rihanna, I'm going to be honest with you, although I knew it was the way, that time to put in the months, you know, month five, month six, you're looking back, you're like, well, I've worked six months, busted my butt, and I have no results. To still continue to have that resolve is very tough. And so, you know, most people would throw in the towel at that point, uh, but that's why most people don't have the results they want, right? It's well, that's why there's 95% failure rate in real estate investing, yeah. because people get into it thinking it's fast money and they don't realize, no, it, real estate investing is hard. It's, it's not fast money, but like Dave Ramsey has a say, um, if you're willing to live like no one else, you'll be able to live like no one else. Yes, yes. You know, and so if you were to jump up on a rooftop and you had a captive audience of people that were hanging on your every word and they were going to hear and heed your advice, what would your advice be? So I like simplicity here, right? I'm going to say, just do it. I'm going to go with the Nike slogan. And the truth is no one wishes they would have started this later. Everyone wishes they would have started it sooner, yeah. right? Even looking back, I wish I would have bought more. I wish I would have gone harder. Now it's easy, you know, hindsight's 2020. 20. No one has a crystal ball. I didn't know what was going on, right? Ultimately, I bought a lot in Knoxville, Tennessee, which was a great market. You know, it's a, a state that a lot of people move to. So it's, I couldn't have predicted that. Um, but I think that if you just do it, you're not going to have the regret. And as long as you're smart and putting the pieces together, I think you'll be okay. So take take the massive action. It's always worth it. I can promise you that. Do something your future self will thank you for. Yeah, and education is important. That's been a big thing Josh has mentioned a few times. But education without action doesn't get you anywhere. It It's, you know, so you, you do need to know what you're doing and be educated. And then you need to... Take action, no excuses, just results. I Josh, love thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be a guest on my podcast. I really appreciate you really breaking things down, sharing what you shared. I think giving people a peek behind the curtain, like this is really how it works, is really helpful. And that's what this podcast is all about. And it was great to finally meet you. Uh, Rihanna, you as well. And hey, I have one thing for your audience. I have a gift for them. So we created a, a free course. So if anybody wants to go to multifamilywealthnation.com and then go to Academy, they can go ahead and access it there. Or if they want to email me, I'm happy to send it to them. Josh at multifamilywealthnation.com. It's about an hour and a half. There's no sales pitch in it. It's all really good content. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's enough to decide if you want to do multifamily and understand it at a high level. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, really good content. So yeah. Um, what all, what are, did you join my group? I think so. Yeah. I'm in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So once we're done here, jump in the group and go to where we were live and drop the links in there for people. Okay. Perfect. In I'll the chat, in the chat part of this, this, um, live, mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, people can contact you or click on those links and find that those resources. Perfect. Yeah. And I, and I hope they help, right? Because it's like yeah. bullish on this asset class. And obviously we know what real estate's done for us. 
Um, it's changed not only my life, but my, you know, my kids, when I have them, my parents, my brother. So it's been a, a very beneficial journey. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience with us. And thanks everybody for joining us. And again, go out there and take action. No more excuses. Go get results. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Josh.